for instance, you know, when, when you're sort of setting out the order for an album, you know, you might be going, oh, that's a great track. No, that doesn't quite work there. Or there might be a track that doesn't work with the others, for instance, you know, or in the order or something. So you have to work out the best order and the best, the best tracks that fit slot together. And then so that track might be left off, but it's never forgotten. So it'll either turn up later or part of it might turn up later. We'll go, yeah, let's take that riff and do something else with it or something, or let's sort of halve the tempo of it or change the feel of it. Or, so nothing gets wasted. What's up, everybody? It's Keefe at GhostCultMag.com, and I'm honored to welcome in Nigel Glogger of Zaxxon. How are you doing, sir? Hey, good. Good to meet you, man. <laughs> lovely, to, lovely to meet you. Longtime fan of Saxon. Interviewed the band many times. Followed your career probably from the very beginning before Saxon even. Uh, a fan of some of your very early works and uh, oh, associate, associated bands. Uh, and uh, But yeah, we're here to talk about the new Saxon record, uh, yeah. Hell, Fire and Damnation. It's out now on Silver Lining Music, the very esteemed Silver Lining Music. What a banger of an album, sir. Great job all around <laughs> by everybody. Yeah, great. No, great expression. We're really pleased with it. And it's, you know, we've had some great reviews and it's uh, doing great all over everywhere. You know, Europe here. Great. Yeah, uh, that's the right word. Uh, you know, uh, for such a serious record, and we know what a fan uh, Biff is of history and some of these very serious topics that he's really thrown his weight into lyrically, such a fun heavy metal album like we need some fun in our lives the world is on <laughs> fire and so terrible and it's just a refreshing uh, you know and listen to so much brooding and sad music and it's so great to hear this uplifting powerful heavy metal again it's great yeah cool brilliant yeah yeah it's pretty pretty miserable things going on at the moment aren't they so so much so and and again i always feel like sad and heavy and you know dark and harsh music there's uh, some scientific fact that says it makes you feel better about your own state of the world but yeah. uh this is such this record's a triumph and uh you know like i said it sounds like it's it sounds fun musically uh and i just you know i wanted to kind of start with the you know saxon's been on a tremendous run uh you know since you've been back in the band and i uh, just wanted to know over the years has the approach to creating albums changed at all since you've been back or is it just kind of this you know just sort of every, guys in a room writing songs and uh coming up with their parts no i, I think it you know generally it's sort of it's pretty much the same um you know everyone's got little sort of studios or writing things at home so everyone gets ideas down and you know, once once we know, you know, I mean, this is going on all the time. People are just, you know, people are getting ideas together all the time in spare time and whatever. And as soon as we've got the schedule, oh, we've got to record an album, then everyone piles it all out and we sift through it. And Biff, for instance, might sift through some and see what inspires him to write lyrics to, or he might have... He might have a lyric idea or a title in mind. I mean, everyone throws titles in anyway, song titles. So it's just a big amalgamation of everything, you know. And then, you know, when when the schedule comes in, we've got to get an album done, bang, then everyone piles in with everything and, and we sift through it and see what happens. Nice one. Good, good to hear that that's still the process and everybody's uh, sharing, oh, yeah. collab collaborating. Of course, I have to ask about one of my absolute heavy metal heroes. Uh, Brian Tatler has joined the band. What, did what does yeah. Brian bring to the table uh, in terms of as a guitarist and a contributor to sax? Oh, yes, great. I mean, he's a, you know, we've known Brian for quite some time because Diamond Head, you know, supported us, have supported us on gigs. So, you know, we get on great with him. And um, when Paul decided that he didn't want to do it anymore, um, you know, Brian was the obvious choice. And just obvious, we wanted something, you know, someone from our era, from our type of music, and that was it was just obvious, you know, he had to be British, um, obviously with the name Saxon, I guess. Uh, <laughs> but uh, mind you, I think Saxon he comes from Germany, isn't it? I don't know, whatever, anyway. Um, but uh, no, it was just the right thing to do, you know, we couldn't, I've mentioned this before, we didn't want to get like some sort of 20 year old youtube whiz kid in that wants to play eight million notes a second and look at me look at me that's not what it's about you know and brian sort of like we are sort of grew up with a blues bass sort of heavy rock and stuff it's, it, it's just a perfect fit right you have to find somebody that matches your energy and uh, where you are in life there's only one you know richie faulkner out there or andy sneep where you could just get lucky and get somebody with an old soul who's uh, got a, a little fire in the belly, but Brian's just wonderful. I've interviewed Brian yeah, before. Yeah, he is. 
He's just a yeah. lovely fellow and a, like a, a, also a legend. So he matches you guys in terms yeah. of the pedigree, which, you know, I feel like is important. And again, if you're going to do touring even less than you used to do, you're still doing tours and festivals. You got to get along with somebody. You have to get on with somebody when you're not on stage. Exactly. exactly. Oh, yeah. No, no, don't say less touring. No, we're sort of, uh, we seem to be ramping it up this year. I mean, this is a damn busy year. You know, we've got... Um, I mean, I don't know if you know, but I live in Dallas. So uh, I've got to head over to the UK, sort of beginning of March. You've got some rehearsals. Then we go on tour with Judas Priest, uh, an arena tour with Judas Priest, um, Uriah Heeper uh, opening. We're in the middle. So we, we do that, go to Europe with that. Then we come back here and do six weeks of these there, over here with Heap. And then, and then I head straight back to the UK and it's festival season, you know, so it's like nonstop. <laughs> But it's great, you know. We enjoy it. Nice work. Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, we also love Uriah Heep. I have seen Uriah Heep with Saxon. I've seen Uriah Heep with Priest. And uh, what a tremendous killer bill that is. Uh, I did not know yeah. you lived in Dallas. That's what what brought you to yeah, the yeah, US. Yeah. Yeah. Why uh, why the US if not and not uh, England or Europe? Um, well, a couple. Of, I mean, I mean, I love it over here. You know, and uh, the weather's better down here. <laughs> Although, you know, th three weeks ago, I think it was uh, it was like freezing. I was going out with a thick coat on, woolen hat, gloves, you know, and I said to a neighbour, I said, God, I got away from England for, you know, get away from this in England, and it's now bloody followed me. So, <laughs> there but it's, is. you know, it's a nice uh, balmy 70 degrees today, so it's great. Oh, nice. I, I was a lifelong East Coaster and I moved to the West Coast because I was like, where can I get a uh, city that's like Boston without the snow? And I moved to San Francisco. So that's... Oh, so you're I, there, I, I'm, are you? I'm, I'm a trader. I'm on the West Coast now. And uh, <laughs> I, 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 I love it here. I repeat, you know, obviously, uh, you know, I get tough times in every major city. Dallas is a fine city and uh, a lot of good food and a lot of good music if you care to go out yeah. and venture out and uh, hear some good live music and art, entertainment and art and, in that and, city. And round where near I am, there's a couple of really good British pubs. So that's... I found the British pub of San Francisco this weekend. I, by oh, accident, cool. I'm, I'm actually kind of off drinking right now, but I will be back and I will return to that place. I was like, oh, this place is legit, <laughs> legit. Uh, craft beer, fish and chips. Oh um, yeah, lot of union, lot of Union Jack, a lot of uh, Queen Elizabeth photos. I was like, how interesting. <laughs> there's a yeah, contingent. No, there's, a conti there's a contingent. I've got one in, thing in I've got to say over here. You guys call you know in England we have shepherd's pie and cottage pie, right? Which I I mean I love cottage pie, but you keep putting it in all the restaurants I've been in over here. You call it shepherd's pie. No, shepherd's pie is made with lamb. Cottage pie is made with ground beef. That's it. There's one thing that had to be sorted out. I did not know that, and now I do. I'm ah, really, I'm, there I'm, you go. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to know. I'm pleased to know. I'll do some, <laughs> I'll do, I'll, I'll do some beans on toast. I'm not against it. Uh, I need to get back over to the, to, to the UK. Uh, it's been far too long. We have a, we started in Europe, Ghost Cult, and we have a big staff in the, in, in the UK. Uh, a lot of former okay. mag magazine folks uh, from, from your yeah. metal magazines who help run Ghost Cult. So very, very oh. thrilled. Uh, let's talk, uh, just kind of delving into the music for a second. One of the, I think, most outstanding things about this record is there's so much groove and i think you know we've gotten so much fantastic uh, and uh, to rhyme fantastic with bombastic heavy metal in the history of saxon but i love some of these sort of down tempo halftime songs and parts of songs that are just re really yeah. lo locked in on the rhythm section there it's beautiful yeah i mean i'm really pleased you say that because for me the most important thing is obviously i've got it i go down first so you know you've got to i've got to lay the sort of foundation so we say but for me the groove is the most important thing you know that that really is you haven't got the groove anything that goes on top it's not going to work um and we you know spend a lot of time um when we've worked out songs i mean i always play with a click track i but i mean it's just something i've just got used to you know i like to you know in a, ver in a verse, I like slightly play maybe just behind the beat slightly and then push it for a chorus, which is, and then you pull back again. Sorry, a drummer thing, but um, it's it's always important to me. So we, we sort of set up a click and uh, I play along to it and, and we sort of adjust the tempo to make sure it sits right in the pocket. 
you know, right we try on. different temp, we might speed something up, say two beats a minute or take it down two beats, whatever sits right. And then, then I start recording. Right on. As a, as a former bassist, I'm always interested in the mechanics of drumming and how drums and bass go together. So of course I listen right. for that. I listen for that and it's very rewarding. And again, I have been a fan going back quite a long way uh, of yours, even out of Saxon. So uh, right. yeah, th this record's killer. I have my favorite songs. I think Madame Guillotine's my absolute favorite, but also 1066, it's yeah. just a, a banger. And uh, Witches yeah. of Salem's got a little place in my heart. I used to live in Salem, Massachusetts, and I'm very, a big, oh, fan okay. of, big fan of terrible American history and the terrible things we do to people. <laughs> um, there's there's some interesting stuff there also, uh, you know, mob yeah. mentality and things. So lovely job all around by the band, musically lyrically by Biff um yeah. is it do you guys ever have you know get to a, a an album and there's songs you bin and you don't keep because I'm always curious if there's like some leftovers out there unfinished oh yeah tracks. yeah definitely I mean what tends to happen is you know we'll work things up and um you know I mean sometimes we might get some that are left over but they're never binned everything's kept but it might be that certain, you know for instance, you know, when, when you're sort of setting out the order for an album, you know, you might be going, oh, that's a great track. No, that doesn't quite work there. Or there might be a track that doesn't work with the others, for instance, you know, or in the order or something. So you have to work out the best order and the best, the best tracks that fit slot together. And then so that track might be left off, but it's never forgotten. So it'll either turn up later or part of it might turn up later. We'll go, yeah, let's take that riff and do something else with it or something or let's sort of halve the tempo of it or change the feel of it. Or, so nothing gets wasted. Good to know. Uh, of course, note my use of binned instead of trash. When you spend enough time around some Brits, chatting with them all the time, you say, you start picking up the dialect a little bit. So I said, <laughs> that, was, that was that was my gift to you. Um, just, just to show you I'm in the know a little bit. Uh, but yeah, um, you know, such a, such a, a great consistency to the history of sax and the whole history. So I, I, I do feel like the band really cares about, you know, maybe not thinking about it in the middle of making a record, but it's just clear that uh, legacy is important to the band. Uh, mm -hmm. To be able to play these songs live, I'm very excited to hear some of them. And yeah. uh, it, it feels like the band just, there's a level of care. I don't see a lot of level of care in newer bands. I think it's just like desperate to get music out and get into the world and all these competitive things with social media and streaming. But Saxons, uh, as a veteran band, it feels like as a as a that you guys care about you know what the quality of what you do. Oh yeah, we do. I mean, I'm you know, I mean, I can only speak for myself, sort of thing. But I, I mean, I'm very fussy about my drum parts. You know, I won't let anything go just to get the track done. If you know what I mean. It's like, no, I'm, I'm extremely fussy. And for instance, with Andy Sneap, you know, he, he'll take my drum tracks and then he'll start mucking around with EQs and stuff, but he'll send them to me so I can hear them. So we discuss them before anything else goes on top of them. Well, maybe stuff has gone on top, but he'll send it to me separately so I can hear, you know, so no, I'm, I'm extremely fussy. Andy is terrific. I've got to interview him once, and anybody I've ever interviewed that's worked with him has nothing but just huge praise for him no, as a he's producer. Great. I mean, he yeah. Is, yeah, I mean, he is great. He's, you know, he's a joy to work with. Uh, he's a lot of fun. Um, he gets us as a band. He understands what we're about. You know, there have been maybe things in the past where a producer hasn't really got us, if you know what I mean. He's like, he's, he's about making a great record, but maybe it's not quite Saxon as such, if you know what I mean. Whereas, you know, it's almost like, I mean, a lot of people think that, um, you know, the Crusader album production was a bit, you know, a lot of people that, but I, you know, when we play Crusader live, it's like a dreadnought. So that's the thing. And Andy gets that. He gets the power of the band. Right on. Is there, is there any uh, songs that kind of take shape live that, are enhanced as, you know, like, I know there's a school of thought This is a song is never, jazz guys will say a song is never done until you've played it live and it takes on a different form. Is there any Saxon classics or current music that, you know, has kind of changed live from where you recorded it? Um, no, I don't think so. I mean, we tend to sort of, you know, we try to get the thing, get the tracks to a position where they are playable live. You know, we live's always in the thought. Obviously, we want to make a great album, but always thinking, always thinking live as well, because you've got to go out and do it. And I mean, the point is, and then we re re routine them all live anyway, as such, 
you know, so everyone sort of gets their parts. There may be certain embellishment guitar wise, maybe that that go on after little things like filling in little cracks here and there sort of thing. But generally it's um, as it is, you know, we don't use backing tracks or anything like that. Not interested. Right on. I know there's a lot of controversy right now about backing tracks. I feel like in a limited capacity, some backing tracks are okay, but I feel like I agree. The, if I see the band and they're over relying on them, it's very disappointing. And oh, uh, yeah, I, I mean, does, yeah. not talking about the age of a band or a genre or a style, no. any band, if you over rely, and I see yeah. a band not actually playing, not actually playing, and so oh, yeah, pantomime, I'm not a fan. Yeah, no, I mean, I've seen, I mean, you know, there's been bands that we've played on festivals with, and I, I know for a fact, you know, they've got 20 tracks running. And I mean, that's ridiculous. You know, I, I mean, I'm all for it if, you know, if you've got a little, say you want a choir on something, you know, just to give it a bit of oomph, then that's fine, you know. But um, no, I mean, I went, I went and I'm not going to say who it was. Um, not that I don't even think they're together anymore, but I went and saw a band. I mean, even the lead vocal was on track. The whole lot was. I mean, I, I, they had a you know bass player, and I thought, oh, great voice there. Wasn't anywhere near the microphone. That's, that's you know, and that that's is just that's ridiculous because you're cheating people that are paying money right. to I, see you. I think there's probably, uh, and again, I don't want to sound like a get off my lawn kind of old guy, but I do feel like there's maybe a younger aesthetic, the modern aesthetic, maybe that's more appropriate to say than younger that uh, people want to hear it like the record and maybe bands can't play it like the record anymore. So a string section, yeah. a horn section, a that's, choir. Yeah, that's true. Orchestration, that's true. I'm not against it. Like, you know, there's no. some very very soundtracky stuff out there that bands have done or some sequencers. Uh, yeah. I'm a big... I'm a big 70s prog fan, so I love all the Me too. Pro progressive. I know you are. I know you are. Uh, um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm a big fan of sequencers and things like that. But if it's the whole track, it's not It's not enjoyable no. anymore. I mean, that's, you, may as well, you may as well just put four or five cutouts up there. <laughs> but you know? I would love to see it. I, I wish a band would. Um, there was a funny tour. <laughs> I did see a tour where a band their bass player was injured and he couldn't tour and they had to decide to either lose the tour completely or go on tour for like i think half the tour without their basses so they put his tracks on and they had yeah. a uh like the old blow up punch punch uh, inflatable yeah. oh stick. yeah i know what you mean yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and they had a, a an inflatable of their bass player with like a uh, so that's great. It I was mean, hilarious. That's, I mean, they acknowledged yeah. it. They said, "Listen, we didn't yeah, want to cancel exactly. the tour. You all paid for tickets. Joe can't be yeah. here." <laughs> yeah, and they no, did that right. for about fifteen shows. And I saw it live, and I I didn't hate it. I was like, "Okay, I wish that guy was here." But he did yeah. record his parts for yeah. the tour specifically for yeah. them to take his parts on tour. So yeah. at least it's really think, him playing. It's just he's not there. Yeah. No, I think that I think I think yeah. in a you know a serious situation like that, I think that's allowed. And plus the fact they're sort of taking the Mickey out of it as well. You know, by having this inflatable. No, they're not trying to hide it. It's blatantly obvious, and that's fine. It's when people try to hide it that's what annoys me. Yeah, and then I think they even made like a, a they had a jokes. They would like punch it at, in between songs. Like he's not here. Pow. Uh, so you know you gotta have a you gotta have a laugh. Brilliant. You gotta have a laugh yeah. sometimes. Yeah. Gotta take a bad yeah. situation and make it better. Yeah. Just a, just a few more questions for you, man. Uh, out, of, out of curiosity, over the years or even more recently, have you changed anything about your drumming or your kit setup between the last record and now that maybe has uh, you know sent you in a new direction or any new flavors as a drummer? Um, I'm I'm always looking for for different things. You know, I mean, my kit setup's been the same probably for the, about the last three or four tours. But um, I'm constantly looking for other things. I get off on sound when I'm playing, you know, and um, I have like lots of little like splash cymbals and bell cymbals and just odd little things, you know, that I can sort of quickly, if I'm playing live, can quickly sling something in that's like make people go, oh, what was that, you know? So, but I, I constantly get off on, on, on sound. So, yeah, I'm always looking for things. I mean, I, I think I've got the basic sort of, setup i've had for a little while now but then i sort of add things to it maybe another little maybe a, a second little snare drum my little pop snare drum might come from somewhere you know like a, i've still got to decide you know the kit's constantly evolving shall we say nice good to hear and maybe that. and maybe change you know maybe changing 
some models of symbols and stuff. That's the frequent one I hear. There's so many, so much new technology and symbol making and so many new approaches that I, I think uh, yeah. it's uh, kind of like painting with an endless paint box, right? Uh, an endless palette. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's sort of things, you know, at the moment I, I use them, um, like, you know, I'm endorsed by Peisty and I, I've got the, the um, Stuart Copeland ride, which I absolutely love. It's got a great bell on it. But over here, I've got the purple, I think purple anyway, the Danny Carey one, which is quite a heavy ride symbol. But then I listen to something and I think, yeah, maybe I should have put a second ride up that's a bit more, bit more swishy, a bit more, you know, sort of washy, you know, still have the big heavy one with its nice bell, but maybe put a second one up somewhere. I don't know. As I say, it's constantly involving all the time. Nice. Nice shout outs there to the police and uh, Danny Carey of Tool. I'm such a big Stuart Copeland fan and came up in a conversation the other day with me and another journalist. And I was like, yeah. when you think about how much pop music uh, the police made and that Stuart and Andy, you know, allow, you know, uh, Sting, Sting does his thing, right? And then Stuart is yeah. doing all these crazy, complicated, oh, yeah. technical, outrageous. outrageous technical drum parts. Yeah during yeah. these sublime pop songs like i don't think people yeah. will really really even appreciate it. and andy also is doing like marvelous guitar work that i don't think yeah. people are conscious of sometimes no i don't know I, I mean i watched that like you know when they reformed a few years ago there's a there's a video on youtube the live gig i think from somewhere in japan might be tokyo i'm not sure and i mean stuart that's it i mean the first song i was like whoa you know he's like outplaying himself i'm like geez no he's great Nice work. Uh, just for a final wild card question, I like to ask every artist a wild okay. card question. And so I have a simple one for you, I think, which is uh -oh. who's your favorite drummer that you listen to to enjoy and uh, just as a just as a leisurely listen, who's your favorite drummer? Oh, there, I mean, there, there isn't there isn't one. Knock it down to one. I mean, I, you know, I love watching stuff. When I get time, I love watching stuff on YouTube. I love watching Billy Cobham, you know, all these players. I mean, Vinnie Colliuta, great, you know. Um, there's there's so many. There really are so many. I, I can't nail it down to can't nail it down to just one. You know, like watching some of the old Buddy Rich stuff. You know, Louis Belson, all that stuff. You know, and Bill Ward. I love watching the old Bill Ward. You know, the old Black Sabbath videos and stuff. He's hammering the crap out of his drums. You know, absolutely. I went and saw them on the um, Masters of Reality tour. And it was like, I've never, I was right up, I've never seen anyone hit a drum kit that hard up till then, you know. I thought he was going to shear his rack tom off, you know, but he was playing great, absolutely playing great. And I, I loved his playing, you know. And a few years ago, I had good fortune to meet him, had a good laugh with him at a, a thing. Um, I was over in uh, Anaheim for the NAMM show, and there was this sort of award thing after that we got. And... Um, in a, in the hotel for I think it was a heavy metal hall of fame or something like this anyway and I finally met him down there and it was great great you know sort of made my evening that did brilliant because I just I just love his drumming but I'm just out I, I get on and watch other people Terry Bozio love Bozio Bruford you know Phil Collins all of them they're great you know they've all got they've all got sort of things that I've sort of I'm trying to that I've tried to sort of put into parts of my playing you know, I just feed off all this stuff. Nice work. People do not remember what an incredible drummer Phil Collins was also because he's such a huge pop star. Uh, lovely to hear you unpack all that. Bill Ward is also lovely, former Ghost Cult interviewee. Uh, a drummer's drummer, Nigel from Saxon. Sir, it's been a, a real pleasure to meet you and chat with you today. Uh, Hellfire Thank and you very much. Yeah, Hellfire and Damnation is out now on Silver Lining Music. Thank you so much for hanging out with Ghost Cult. I really appreciate it. Hey, thank you for having me on. Anytime, man. All right.